be here today to share in the wonderful, awesome, loving, merciful, healing presence of Jesus our Savior and King and our wonderful, ever-present, always loving, always interceding, caring, nurturing, uh, looking before us and behind us on our, on our right and our left, Mary Immaculate, Queen of the Universe. Through the many long years, um, I had, uh, I had, you know, conflict. I didn't have conflicts, but people had conflicts with me because of my Marian devotion. They didn't. People didn't see Mary as an integral part of the life and times of Jesus Christ, and consequently, our, um, our, um, our life and our great need for her. And through the many years, um, I had going to interfaith services, um, people would tell me, like, uh, if you, you know what, you have this dynamic, powerful, healing gift from Jesus Christ. You have this gift. But if you just put all those other people aside, which was Elizabeth of the Trinity, John Paul II, Teresa Elizabeth, if you put all those other people aside, we could make you great. Mm -hmm. We could make you famous because you got the goods, you got the gift. So just forget about the Blessed Mother. You have Jesus Christ, you have his word, you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I said, but I can't leave my conscience behind. How could I leave my source, my treasure, my, my everything? And one time, like in the 80s, uh, even after I received the powerful, wonderful, charismatic gift of, the, of healing, which happened at a nine-day novena in honor of Mary Emanuel Queen. Um, but even after you know, I received the gift of healing, um, I would have that conflict. People would come and say, you know, we like Jesus, but we don't think Mary has always, through all the many years. And then the people that like the Blessed Virgin or have devotion to Mary, they don't like the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, we don't, I met the lady, was waiting for me there. She came to the, I knew her when I was a young messenger of Mary Necker Queen. But she, I said, come in. I haven't seen her in 40 years. She said, I remember when he prayed over my son, he had uh, leukemia, I think. And um, I brought him to the service. And I left the room. And when I came back, he was on the floor. And I was so terrified. But anyway, he was totally healed of his leukemia. But anyway, she was just, I said, come in. She said, I don't like the singing. Mm -hmm. But I was like, well, wouldn't poor singing the rosary right now? <laughs> I was like, come on in. But what I'm saying is, um, anyway, so as most, some of you know, like in the 80s, well, you know, the, the 70s when the Second Vatican Council uh, was misinterpreted and they came out with the erroneous conclusion that you know, we should really put Mary in the background, and the churches, you know, were, uh, they took out the statues of Mary, and there was kind of like this Father Patrick Payton, the great, famous, world-traveling rosary priest, said to me, he said, they have suddenly, he was a worldwide preacher of Billy Graham, you know, stature, Billy Graham, um, and, uh, Father Payton and Bishop Sheen, where they're all in the same era. They all had these dynamic ministries. Uh, Father Payton would go to different countries and have these mag um, these uh, multitudes. But anyway, um, but anyway, he said, you know, I was at a dinner with him in the Holy Cross, uh, not a congregatory at Notre Dame, where the priests were talking about him, and they were. Re saying, oh, to be a pet, you know, your rosary crusade, like, never took off. Oh, ouch. And, he, and he was like, thanks to men like you. Mm. It was real, though. What I'm saying is there was a real void about devotion to Mary. And it was, like, wrong. It was like, uh, but how could you leave? How could you leave your heart behind? How could you leave your mother? But at any rate, through the years, I know in my own experience, I was doing an Ignatian, exec, uh, Ignatian retreat 
maybe in the middle 80s. And I was, I felt like I was like on a tightrope where the charismatics were trying to pull me one way, the Marriott people were trying to pull me the other, and I was like, you know, what, anyway, so I was thinking, well, maybe, you know, maybe the devotion to Mary Macla Queen, you know, like maybe it's kind of like, you know, over the top. Maybe it's like, maybe like Mary of Nazareth would do. But anyway, I was doing this retreat and it consisted of many very serious long meditations. And the final meditation, it was a seven day uh, private retreat. And the final day, the, the, the meditation was on um, um, thanking God for all his blessings in your life. But I was kind of thinking, I was thinking, well, maybe Mary Michael Queen is kind of not, maybe it's over the top. And also she gave, she said to me, I have a new mission for you now. And my pastor had told me, he said, you, you know, you have the gift of healing now. She has a new mission for you now, go in another direction. But it was the bottom line, I was like, I can't leave my heart behind. But at any rate, I was thinking of that I was, as I made this final meditation on the exercises. So I knelt before the Sacred Heart of Jesus in my little prayer room. And I just said, you know, Lord, you know, and Father Brennan, you know, he gave me, you know, a little lecture on gratitude in general, God's love and all God has done for you. And But he said, you know, Barb, you know, you've received the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He said, you know, that's so dynamic and powerful. And who gets to see people heal? Not very many people really get to witness God's healing power and changes of life. And so you, when you do your meditation, you know, be sure that you really, you know, encompass all that God has done. So I begun my, I said, Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Please show me where I should be the most grateful for. Show me gratitude in my life. There's a, all of us, if we do it that way, there's a million things from our childhood that we could say, I'm grateful for this, I'm grateful for that. We'd have a long list. But suddenly, and I never have visions. This was the only vision I ever had. So very suddenly, I saw my incubator. I was born very premature. I was like, I think I was an incubator for six months but uh i saw i saw mary praying over my incubator and it was like the lord was saying my mother saved your life and then um i should have been blind because there was too much oxygen in the incubators at that time and she she saved me from being blind but it was so clear. It was like, and you're thinking, <laughs> you're thinking. <laughs> but at any rate, um, then I saw, I saw how she was with me all my life. I saw in so many instances of peril and trouble and conflict and fear and anxieties, I saw that the Blessed Virgin Mary was with me when I was a kid and I, you know, I knew her as a child, I prayed, prayed the rosary, as a lot of us did in that era, we all believed that if we said enough rosaries, we would convert Russia. That was a common thought amongst young Catholic kids. But at any rate, um, Mary was always there for me, and the rosary, when I was at Maryville, it was a home for dependent children, it was like an orphanage. And um, I never, we never, kids, there was 800 kids there. Uh, but, you know, every other Sunday was called Visitor Sunday, and I never got visitors. Mm -hmm. We just, my parents, you know, you read from my book that, you know, they had their difficulties, and consequently, and things were different. Everybody didn't have cars like they do. There wasn't that same affluence then. But at any rate, um, I, we didn't have visitors, and I, so I was lonely. I was a child. I, w I was at Maryville from the time I was like 7 to 17. But at any rate, on, this, on these lonely Sundays, they'd call out the kid's name, like, you know, Kathy Snow, your, your, your parents are here, or Joanne Doe, your dad is here, or someone else. But they never called our name. So as a consequence, like, I went into the chapel, and I found uh, 
the Stations of the Cross. I was lonely, I was anxious, I was afraid. But when I looked at Jesus as condemned to death, Jesus receives the cross. Jesus falls the first time. Jesus meets his mother. Veronica wipes his face. Jesus falls again. But with everything, like I understood, and it was a lifetime gift. Because from that time on, I realized that Jesus really had gone before us and take, he said, Barb, you don't have to carry that burden anymore. I died on the cross for you. I carried the cross for you. I bled to death for you so that you would be free. You would be whole. And that you would have the abundant life that I proclaim. Bishop Sheen says that um, Christ, like on the cross, and all through his whole life, through the life of Christ, like he was like an open sponge. That would, like he said, it's as if he goes through all the hospital wards in the whole world, as if he goes into the cities and towns and sees the oppressed, the addicted, the homeless, the starving, the perverts, and every other thing. And it's as if he absorbs into his sacred heart all our woundedness, all our, our fears, our infirmities, our weaknesses. So as we think today, we come together to be healed. And we see in the life of Jesus that his whole life, they say in one of the writings of the mystics, like um, I think uh, Mary Vagrida says, when Jesus was a little boy, the neighbors used to come and say, Mary's boy can heal you. Go and ask Jesus to heal the boy Jesus to heal. That's his function, that's his mission, and that's why he takes upon himself. As we're in the uh, you know, Lenten season now, sometimes you think, oh, I don't want to think about the suffering. You know, because it's hard, and if you really think about it, it's like, oh, you know, he suffered so much. And, and then, but anyway, um, but then the victory is ours. He suffered that we would totally be freed and delivered and healed and restored and renewed and blessed. And when Jesus healed the sick, it's never enough for him to just heal. He heals, then he anoints. So that's his goal for each of us today, that he will absorb our infirmities. And also I think as being in the ministry for many long years, I feel that like people in general, people are still walking around with their childhood scars. And like something happens to a person today, and like it seems like a kind of a non-issue, but they're wounded. It's like, it's like stabbing an, an open wound that is inside of someone. And the, the healing power of Jesus Christ isn't just to heal us externally. He doesn't want to just take away our memories. He doesn't want to just take away our arthritis, our back pain, our whatever. But he wants to he wants to absorb. He wants to to drag out all the scar tissue, carve it out of us. Like that is the power of Jesus Christ. And that is the the, the promise of Jesus Christ. And that's why, as one, as a, you know, 2,000 years, for 2,000 years, the world, who has a totally different standard of life, of living, of experience, and of, of goals, is trying to pound down Jesus. We don't want them. We don't want, we don't want prayer in school. We don't want, we don't want, um, we don't want to have to obey your stupid commandments. Get those commandments off the school walls. Get the, get the prayer out of the schools. Get, get him out. Get Jesus Christ out. For 2,000 years. From the time they tried to get rid of him in, 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 in Nazareth, when he first preached, he said, I come to heal the sick, to free the captives, to release the prisoners, and to proclaim a year of favor on behalf of the Lord. They were like, who is he? Who? Oh my goodness, who could speak like that? Immediately 
they wanted to throw him off a cliff. They didn't even wait to he talked again. Right from the time Jesus Christ was public, they were like, out. We don't want him. We don't want his message. We don't. But what they're saying is, in reality, so what has happened now? He's out. Jesus Christ is out. In general, he's out. Um, when you look at the Billy Graham Crusades that have, that have happened for you know many long decades, they, someone asked whether there could, where's, will there be another Billy Graham? And um, you know the response was, the world has changed. The world has changed. The world is kind of anti. Christ, kind of, it's very antichrist. Like the media, the culture, the world dictates our how we think, how we feel, what we buy, what we how we shop, what we look like, what products we buy. And he's out. But in putting him out, like what are we left with? What are we left with? We are left with emptiness. We are left with loneliness. We are left with despair, with dis discouragement, with false means and ways and paths that only bring us d destruction. But we see this Jesus of Nazareth, like right from his early days, when the first recognition of Jesus was at the, at, 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 um, the when he was baptized by uh, John in the desert at the Jordan. Um, and just like they looked at him, they looked and John the Baptist announced to him, he said, oh my gosh, this is why I was born. This is why I went into the desert at three years old. This is why I ate the wild locusts and, and I, I starved myself and I fasted and I prayed. For this moment, he's here. He saw, he saw, John the Baptist saw the Lord for the first time and he was like, he didn't say, here's the great king of kings, the Lord of lords. He said, behold, the Lamb of God. And they understood it because they had daily sacrifice in the temple of the animals. So they knew what further, like what John meant. John meant that um, he was going to um, be the Lamb of God. He didn't come as a great hero. He didn't come as a great king. He came as a lamb to take away our sins. And he, he, he lived out his life as that lamb of God. As Jesus Christ moved around in his, his life from the time of his infancy, when he was poverty stricken, when he was born in a manger because there was no room for them at the end, when um, at the age of two, when they wanted to persecute and kill all the baby boys, all the way up through his life till he got, um, when they saw him in the Jordan, and, and John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away our misery, who takes away our fear, who takes away our alienation, who takes away our loneliness, who takes away our diseases. That is the Lamb of God, because the Lamb has gone before us and taken upon himself our diseases, our infirmities, whether, whether it's alcoholism or drug issues or uh, any kind of illness. He has absorbed it into his sacred heart, into his being. And he says, you don't have to carry it anymore. So today, that's our prayer. We don't have to carry it anymore. But as Jesus then, Jesus appeared in the Jordan. And Andrew, and Andrew, a disciple of John the Baptist, saw Jesus. He saw Jesus. He was smitten. In a moment, in a second. The magnetism, the power, the love, the tenderness, and the glory of God shined on Jesus Christ. And Andrew saw it immediately, and right away he was captivated. And he said, Master, Master, where are you staying? 
Hvor er gode til, hvor er det fra? There was a story of Jesus' life. Wherever he went, people felt that he was drawing out our misery. He was drawing out their misery, and they knew it. And that's why they gravitated toward him. The multitudes came because a glance, a look, it was enough to totally transform their lives. So as Jesus uh, moved, in, moved on then into his, uh, after the Jordan, then he moved on to, he gathered his disciples sometime in between that and the wedding feast at Cana because the wedding feast was his, was his pu first public um, visitations, first public uh, viewing when people said, when they recognized him again. <coughs> because, uh, but it, and this is so important. Now, the people at the Jordan saw the Holy Spirit come down and say, and John said, this is the Lamb of God. So they, the people at the Jordan were like, oh my gosh, the Messiah has actually come. The one we've been praying for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, has come. So those people all knew, they saw him, and they were changed, transformed, touched, blessed. We want to follow him. So he gathered this following, he picked his disciples, and the first public event he went to was the wedding feast at Cana, which is shows the priority of Mary's place. The first thing Jesus did of public renown was the, they had run out of the wine early in the ceremony, and in those days it would have been a terrible uh, stigma. They'd never get over it. Oh, this family didn't even, couldn't even afford enough wine for the celebration. But it was, this is Mary, and this is what we cannot do without. This is her heart that says, no, it's not okay that there's no more wine. It's not okay that these people are going to be so embarrassed. It's not okay. As she does in our lives. When she sees we lack something, when she sees we're getting in trouble, when she sees we're taking the wrong path, again and, she, again, and again, she's like, isn't that okay? And she's our mother, our mother, our tender, loving, caring, nurturing, ever-present, always faithful mother. Just like at Cana, as she, she spoke to the Lord, and it was the, she spoke to the Lord. As she speaks, if we, when we meet her and we see and we understand that she has spoken for us on our behalf millions of times through our life. When we, when we didn't know where to go or how to get there, when we felt abused, alienated, lonely, deserted, she was already pleading our cause with God because it's an emperor. And again and again, she repeats to him, they have no more wine, Lord, which means life. It means vitality. It means strength. It means health. They have no more wine. They're tired. They're weary. They're broken. But Mary is our, our mother who, who is ever beside us. In so much so that um, although Mary wasn't present during the during the public ministry of Jesus, she wasn't there for his big successes, what the, um, the multitudes of the loaves and the fishes, or all the other in events of his magic, majestic power, but she was there when no one else was there. She was there when the, when the disciples deserted Jesus. When they fell asleep on them, when they they couldn't face the crowds or the the terror of the path to Calvary, Mary was there. As she is, I know in my own experience in life, there isn't a moment of peril in my life that Mary was not present. Mary was not interceding. Mary was not imploring the Lord to help, to rescue, to save to heal, to restore, to renew, to bless. And during these days in which we live, you know, 
We need a mother in a mother's heart. When Jesus was dying on the cross, and even think of Mary on the road to Golgotha, on the road to Calvary. You know, there was pushing and shoving and hitting and spitting and terrorizing Jesus. Like she was just being moved along with the multitude. She was just being moved along. But she never took her eyes off of him. She never took her eyes or her heart or her thoughts off of him. She suffered with him. She entered into that horrendous agony all the way up to the cross. And the thing about Mary, too, is that when they finally got to Calvary and she, well, he, he met her on the road to Calvary, and we can't even comprehend this incredible anguish and sorrow and grief that that meeting was, must have incurred when, when Mary saw him so brutally annihilated, so beaten. This beautiful, strong carpenter's body, strong, healthy, and in a, in a few hours, the body was emulated, unrecognizable. Did Mary look at him and thought, oh, my baby, my infant from, from Bethlehem, he was so beautiful. He was so perfect. He was so full of love and goodness and only caring about everybody else. Like her heart was twisted. And she followed him all the way. But it is incomprehensible to, to think about when they met as he was carrying the cross. It's incomprehensible to imagine what their eyes saw in each other. Because you know, once you love someone, you want to take their pain if you, in any way you can. You don't, we don't want it to be them. It's like, Oh, I, I don't know how to do this, but I, I, not, not him. Mary must say, not, not, not him, Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll cover it. I'll, I'll do it. And our Heavenly Father, He loves us so much. We can't comprehend His love because, you know, we just cannot comprehend this infinite, compassionate, merciful, love of our Heavenly Father that loved us so much that he allowed this terrible annihilation of his only begotten Son. That's how much he loves us. So we could never desert God and think, well, what did he did for me? I had to, I suffered. I was, I was an orphan. I was an alcoholic. I really, what, what did he ever do for me? What did he do for me? All of us, instead of thinking what didn't he what he didn't do, we have to think of what he has done, what he's conquered, that he's taken the victory in our lives, in our families. And he will never, ever, ever be outdone. So as Jesus and Mary met along the terrible road of Calvary, and they finally ended up on Calvary. And they crucified him. And just before he died, as a matter of great priority, he looked at John and he said, Son, behold your mother. Then he looked at Mary and he said, Mary, behold your son. She recommends, they, John, the evangelist, stood for mankind, stood for all of us at the crucifixion. When Jesus could do no more, when his body was totally desecrated, emulated, unrecognizable, when he hung from the cross like the scripture says, a worm and no man, he said, behold my mother. She can help me. When there doesn't seem to be any hope, when there doesn't seem to be any resolution, when there doesn't seem to be any help, when there doesn't seem to be any real deep change, 
He gave us Mary to make those changes in our existence. And she's the great mother, like I saw in my own experience, that she was there at my incubator. She was there uh, and prevented, gave me life, gave, prevented me from being blind. I saw her then in different radical moments of my journey, how she was always there. She was there. She was there. She's here for every one of us. She's here. And the prayer to Mary Nicola Queen is so incredible, um, profound, and powerful. You know, God's ways aren't our ways. We have our ways, and we could tell God easily, well, you know, I'd say it differently. I'd present this view of Mary in a different way. I would say um, whatever way we would all think we could talk to Mary in a better way. But the Blessed Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who created the inspiration of the, the leaflet prayer, it's timeless, it's blessed, it's endless. The Lord didn't ask us to write the prayer. He didn't ask us to be inspired to write it. He didn't ask us, he said, say it. So I implore you, again, everybody, and even if you said, and sometimes, you know, um, the ones that have been, you hear the message so many times that even as much as powerful it is, you kind of put it aside. So I'm imploring every one of you to say the prayer. I could give you so many examples in my, in my life. I had a baby that died of sudden infant death right after I got the mission of Mary Nicola Queen. And my beautiful baby, Brian, he was beautiful. He was healthy. He was in dimples and blue eyes. And um, we were just totally enamored, like your son now. <laughs> but anyway, um, we were so enamored with him that, uh, you know, was he eating? How long was he eating? How long was he sleeping? Did we need more, pa more pablum? Did we, whatever. He was our life. He was the breath that we breathed. And because I had gone, survived and to, God gave me the victory over alcoholism, so this was my kind of like a new start in life where I was going to really, um, change, you know, um, do everything as good as I could and uh, be close to God and Mary. But at any rate, one morning I went in to get him. With no warning, no warning, nothing that indicated he wasn't sick. He wasn't, he was cooing and smiling with his little temples and his blue eyes. But I went in to get him when I, he hadn't woken up and I, I, um, I saw he was dead. He was just turning blue. Oh my gosh, it was like somebody stabbed me in my heart. I just couldn't believe, I couldn't believe that this could happen. And I thought, I was like, what am I going to do? I can't believe this joy of our life is now gone. He's gone. And then I thought, oh, I just felt so filled with anguish and grief beyond description. And then I remembered the prayer to Mary Nicola Queen. I got the prayer. I'm looking at him. It says, oh, Mary Nicola Queen, look down upon this distressed and suffering world. You know our misery and our weakness. Oh, you who are our mother, saving us in this hour of peril. Have compassion on us in these days of great and heavy trial. Jesus has confided to you the treasure of his grace, and through you, wills to grant us pardon and mercy. In these hours of anguish, therefore, your children come to you as their hope. And after reciting that, I was like strengthened. I was strengthened, because I would have been on the floor. I was just strengthened enough to, um, to contact my husband. And then, uh, but she was there when nobody else could be there. When I delivered my twins, no one else could be there. 
And I knew she prayed the same prayers that she prayed over me. In every event in my life, and even as Mary herself stood under the cross, Mary never gave up. She never said, oh, this is it. You know what? They've crucified my innocent son, the Savior of the world, the Son of God. They've killed him. I'm finished. She stood faithfully by the cross. There were so many times and events in my life, and even when she didn't hear my prayers in the manner of way and belief that I had, yet she gave me always, always, always like a endurance, peace that surpasses understanding. When my son Sean died, it was like, a, but somehow she was in it, she was there. She died on her feast day, born on her feast day, he died on her, she died, he died on her, um, her feast day. But Mary McElqueen was in it. She allowed it, and then when the time came, she brought him to salvation seven years later because we were at her shrine in Lourdes. And I, I, was, I was thinking about my son, Sean, because I hadn't heard, I didn't have any feeling like whether he was in heaven, whether he, I just could not conceive that he would have been in hell. That was not within my possibilities. But at any rate, I, um, I, so seven years after he died, I, um, I thought, I'm going to go to Lourdes, and I'm going to uh, pray uh, for Sean, and I want to know that he is saved. So we were on the bus going from Lazul to Lourdes, and we started singing, uh, you know, our songs that the lady didn't want to hear. <laughs> we started singing our wonderful charismatic songs, and and I felt like I felt Sean's presence for the very first time since he had died. The last thing he said to me before he died was, "Mom, I'm still helping you." as he put the, the dishes in the sink, and he was very ill. But at any rate, Mom, I'm still helping you. But at any rate, um, so we were on the bus, and I was, I was thinking, um, anyway, we're on the bus, and then we were singing our songs, and suddenly I could feel Sean's presence. I could feel Sean's presence as if he was visibly before me. But then that, I was felt very vulnerable in my heart. Like I thought, oh no, I just can't. You know, I, I, this will have to be kind of worked out. I'm not grabbing onto butterflies. But at any rate, then Patricia, who was sitting across the aisle on the bus at that very moment, she stands up and she goes, Sean, Sean, Sean. And then I knew that Sean was present. And I was so happy because it was a long wait. But at any rate, then um, when we went, you take the baths and more, you go into the, the water and you pray for your intentions. And uh, when I was coming out of the baths, I saw Sean. I saw Sean. I saw Sean. His arms were raised and his smile was ear to ear. And he goes, look, Mom. We see the Lord. We see the Lord. But and that, nobody could ever convince me. Nobody could ever convince me that what I'm saying is not factual. So then the day we were leaving, Lords, oh my goodness, we were so ecstatic. We were, well, well it was, praise God. But anyway, um, the day we were leaving, um, Patricia and I, again, were walking the plaza. There's a big, big rosary path. We went up by the major Holy Rosary Basilica. And just as we kind of got there, I said to Patricia, I said, you know, in our, in our group, I said people have come for different intentions and petitions. People came for, um, you know, uh, healings and reconciliation in their marriages. And everybody had different intentions. But I came to know 
that Sean was saved. And then suddenly, the strum of a harp went, <laughs> three times. Praise God. And there was nobody in the church. But anyway, I heard it, and Patricia heard it. So even when I'm sitting here in Michael Queen, you know, we can't ignore her. We can't reject her. We can't put her aside because she's real. She's tender. And as one of the saints had said so long ago about her, Mary, when the, when, the, when, the, when the doors of heaven are closed, she always finds a window that she So we know that Mary Echo Queen is a tender, loving mother. And in her royal title and power, we know that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's God's love. How could he repay Mary? He doesn't have to repay Mary. But how, it's a manifestation of God's love for this little Virgin Mary, who at the age of 14 said yes to God, to an undeniable, unknowable, very sacrificial path. To see the woman clothed with the sun, the queen stands at his right hand. To see her in her rightful place is God's desire, not ours. We wouldn't even know the difference. But God knows. And does he ever reward the rewards he gives, as we know, we know. Uh, just as one thing was, like my little grandson, he had, um, he was under the autism spectrum, and uh, he couldn't speak, which is common, you know, but he could not speak, he couldn't, when he was two, he couldn't, you know when the dad comes home, dad, 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 no dad, dad, nothing, 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 no, no mama, no dad, dad, no, nothing, just mute. And he had the, the therapist and the, you know, the thing on the refrigerator, he had every kind of human care that there could, and one day I was babysitting for him, and I, I looked at him and I go, Kevin? I said, say Barbara. And he goes, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. There was no learning any, you know, fruits, vegetables, milk on the refrigerator. It was, he spoke fluently. Then one time I got a call from my 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 um my son Sean and he said, Mom, oh he said, please pray because Eamon, we got Eamon was dig digging a fence. He was preparing to put to put a, a the wood into the ground to make a fence. And the auger came up and it hit him right in the eye. And he goes, Mom. He said his eye is totally bleeding. His no, his face is filled with blood. He goes, I can't tell you what the damages are, but they're bad. And we're on our way to the hospital. But anyway, so all oh, Mary Immaculate Queen look down upon this distressed and suffering world, your misery and our weakness. Oh, you are our mother. About a half hour later, they called and said, the doctor, the physician, said, it is a miracle. He had absolutely no damage to his eye, his nose. The only thing he had was a tiny little dot, red dot, by his eyelid. And that was the extent. And she is the queen of miracles. And if more people trusted in her, and it's not Mary that works the miracles. It's God through her heart, through her motherly heart. He works the miracles. Mary has no intention, no desire. She, you know, and she's got her place in glory forever and ever. She doesn't need our attention. She doesn't need our adulation. But for her divine son, who continues to move along this perilous road where people are rejecting him by the multitudes, 
again, as Bishop Seen said many, many years ago, he said, um, the father came first, and then after a long time, when the world wasn't, was, you know, wavering and sinful and full of sin, he sent his son. And there's going to be another time when the world is, is dark, when God is gone, and he's going to send his mother. And these are the days. So grab onto her. We have this pearl in her of great price. And also, like my, my own life, you know, I received the gift of healing. I wasn't even interested in healing or gifts or anything else. I didn't know about them or care about them because God was our life. And so we saw the miracles long before I received the gift. But at any rate, it was through Mary Immaculate Queen. She was there at Pentecost when the, when the Holy Spirit fell on, on the apostles and her. So love her, pray to her, receive her, acknowledge her, and make God happy by doing so. Console the heart of Jesus by paying attention to his mother. So we, we conclude now by saying that um, we ask Mary, our mother, to go before each one of you as she was there in Bernadette's life, as she transformed Bernadette, as she was there in the life of so many countless heroic Christians. And through her mercy, her love, her intercession, she transformed and changed lives. We ask Mary, our Holy Mother, to look deeply into our heart and to, to Release us from the wounds of yesterday, from the wounds of our childhood, from the, the wounds of our young adult life, from the wounds that we don't even know, like are still vibrant and alive inside of us. And yet when something happens, we connect and we're like, oh, I remember that, and we, which we had kind of thought we long forgotten. I asked Mary now, to intercede for each one of us, that today will be a new day for each of us, that we can give up all the yesterdays. They're gone. And they only have power in as much as we give them. So I was with Ellen at St. Peter's in Rome at the tomb of John Paul II several years ago, and I opened up the Magnificat, and I got that beautiful word. And I knew that it was a gift, this, this verse. It was, be anxious about nothing. Do we hear it? This is the divine word of God. Paul says, be anxious about nothing. No room. No room for anything else. Be anxious about nothing. Not your divorce, not your your behavior, not your anxiety, be anxious about nothing. But in everything, with prayer and petition, with supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the God of peace will give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. I felt that that was a special gift from St. John Paul for us. Because it was so, it is such a profound scripture. And it's, St. Paul says that, you know, the word of God is like a two-edged sword. If we let it get into our heart, it will remove everything that shouldn't be there. So be anxious about nothing. Trust in God. Be anxious about nothing. But in everything, with prayer, Lord, help me to stop drinking. Lord, help me to stop eating. Lord, help me. Help my children, my grandchildren. Help, 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 help. Let your requests be made known to God. And leave it with them. That gives him glory. That's like saying, Lord, here's the terrible weight of my needs and my petitions, but I trust you.
And I know you're going to bring this to a fruitful conclusion. I know you're going to bring this to victory. Let your requests be made known to God. Whatever they are, and, and God doesn't care how ridiculous we might think they are. Or, or I remember I was in Rome one time and I had this experience of God. It was so deep and so unbelievable, so supernatural. And then a Christian brother, who was a biblical scholar, was kind of um, with us, and he was leading us to the magnificent tour of Rome and, and St. Peter's. And I was getting so high on the Lord. I was like getting this, like, do it once in a while, seasonal. <laughs> Seasonally, I get way up there, and then I get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but I still keep going up. <laughs> but at any rate, um, uh, I was getting so, I was like, oh, oh, Lord. You know, Teresa of Avila, as, as we went to St. Peter's in those days, you walk into Teresa of Avila, and she's like, oh, my heart is inflamed. Oh, <laughs> my heart is enlarged. And I'm like, Teresa, pray for me. That I want my heart to be enlarged too. I want to love God with an infinite love. And then Philip Neary is there with, oh, oh totally transformed and inebriated in the love of God. And in the words of uh, Isaiah, I think, um, uh, are under his, his statue, and it says, from on high, he has sent fire into my bones. And he's like, oh. I said, I want that too. I want the fire from the balls. Lord, and as I went down to another realm, um, but it was like, Oh Lord, oh Lord. But anyway, that night when I went to to uh, back to our hotel, I thought I was having a heart attack. I seriously thought I was. I was like, I can't breathe. And my friend's like, No wonder you've been asking the Lord to enlarge your heart all day. <laughs> but anyway, um, but anyway, as I got higher and higher, then I, my prayer got more and more, and finally I just said. I summed it up, and I said, Lord, I want to really love you. I want to love you so much. I want to love you with the combined love of the whole world. I want to love you with the combined love of all your angels and saints. I want to love you, Lord, as no one else has ever loved you before. But I want to, and I, with each petition, I was, <laughs> getting a little higher, but at any rate, um, I want to love you as no one else has ever loved you before. I want to love you, Lord, with every breath that I breathe, with every beat of my heart, with every blink of my eye, increase my love for you, Lord. And um, so then I, I kind of reasonably, I started to think, I thought, oh, um, maybe this prayer is too lofty. <laughs> it occurred to me. <laughs> Well, you know, you're taking all these giants, Peter, Paul, Therese, Teresa, Pamela, John of the Cross, all, and I'm, oh, I want to love him more than that, Lord. <laughs> except for his mother. I couldn't go that far. I said, except for your mother, Lord. But at any rate, um, so I said to my biblical scholar friend, Dermot Barrett, I said, do you think that, you know, it's kind of not right to, you know, could your prayer ever be too lofty? And he said, no, not lofty, but unreasonable. Hmm. So I thought, well, hmm, you know, I still want to love you, Lord, as no one has ever loved you before. I want to love you a bit more and more with every breath that I breathe, through every beat of my heart, with every wind of my heart. Love, 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 give me the love, give me the love, that, give me the love, Lord, that the souls in hell have. Don't, they can't love you anymore. Give me that love. Give me the love of all your people. Give me the love of the mediocre. Give me the love of those that don't know you. Give me love, Lord. Let me be love for you. But at any rate, so Dermot said, no, it's, you know, your prayer couldn't be too lofty, but it could be too, um, it could be unreasonable. And God is so great, you guys. This is like how many, 40 years later, 30 years later, I'm reading a book of Therese. And she's talking about, Lord, 
I know that anything I ask you, because you've assured us, Lord, you have assured us, you said we're two or more together, you would do anything we ask. You told us, you told us, and you, you told us too that, like, all our desires of our heart will be fulfilled. You told us, and she said, and now I know that you're the one that gives us the desires. Where do we get these desires? So Torah says, you're the one that gives us the desires. So nothing could be unreasonable. <laughs> 40 years later, 40 years later, the Lord said, you can't ask for anything unreasonable. So if you want your cancer to disappear, if you want a total reconciliation and new love in your marriage, whatever, you, he, he could do it and he wants to do it. Everything that we desire of him, for him, for his glory, he put into our heart. And then we're too timid. We say, oh, I couldn't ask for that. Well, he's, he's infinite. He's immensity. He's tenderness. He's mercy. He's God. So today, ask with confidence now. And it's easy for him. So we just praise God, everybody, and we have great anticipation that God is going to carve out all the stuff that makes us sad, all the memories that constantly come back to us. Today is the day. This is the day the Lord has made, and it's all the past is over. Thank you. The rains are over and gone. The sound of the turtle doves is heard in their land. Amen, everybody. Amen. Praise God. Amen.